Luck on Sunday, proudly sponsored by Al Basti at Cruel Dubai. Now welcome back to Racing TV this Sunday morning and indeed to Luck on Sunday. Still alongside me, Maddie Playle, uh, Jim Boyle and Emma Sayer. We've said goodbye to a young Kieran Fallon. We're going to get stuck into our talking points now. We've got six points. We've got two minutes on each topic. You know how it works now. Uh, I hope the guests do. Let's get stuck into some talking points. It was the Shergar Cup this week, yesterday, and Jamie Carr, who was over riding for the girls' team, Australian rider, said, so women jockeys, this was in an article in The Guardian, are given rough ride in backward Britain. The statistic that was floated here, three of the top six as far as winners go, uh, this is riders in Australia, are female jockeys, it's two in the top 50 in the UK. Emma, your view on, on what Jamie said about this being a, a backward uh, racing society in Britain. What's your take on it, given as somebody that, that's gone through the industry as a female rider? You know, I actually, I think the, the bottom line is, if, the, if you're good enough, if the talent is there and you're prepared to work hard enough, the opportunities are there for the women riders. You, it's difficult isn't it to argue with the statistics put in front of you? I know, you know, Kevin Blake made an argument about it. You know, prize money is important as well. Yes, but as far as those winners go, three in the top six in the, in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia, and we can only boast two in the top fifty. They're quite striking statistics, Maddie. Yeah, you can't argue with it. And I think, um, you know, it's been really interesting hearing from Emma today about what she feels about opportunities for women, and we'll get on to the three pound allowance that's coming back, I'm sure. But I think. Does there need to be more of an incentive for, for trainers to use female riders? Maybe. How did you, Jim, as a, as a trainer, um, you're, you, you've used Isabel, for, for example, Isabel Francis a great deal, but, but I mean, did you, have an did you feel you had an opportunity to use a number of different female riders, or is that not something that really comes into your consciousness? You see a rider, male or female, and you'll pick the rider that's best for the horse. 100%, but I mean, you know, Isabel's my apprentice. Um, before I had her, you know, Rian Ingram up the road. I was, I was, you know, very happy to use, and and, you know, we use a lot of females, as do as do many other trainers. Uh, look, I think when we go over to Australia, someone has to say something controversial and, and get things blown up. And I think Jamie's done the same over here. The statistics do, you know, lend to uh, 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 something that needs to needs to improve, but things are changing and, and changing for the better, and have done over time, and will continue to do so. You, Emma, very quickly. You, you never necessarily it's something we'll, we'll we'll branch out on, but you never sort of you know felt like a, a female rider in a man. World, per se. No, absolutely not. I think you need to be tough and you need to try and hold your own. And I think, you know, if you can do that, then you will get the success. There will be more on that, uh, but we've only got two minutes on that specific story. The allowance is something we're going to discuss. Do not worry about that. Hayley Turner, not from a female perspective necessarily, for she has very much flown that flag over the years. But Hayley, in, in the set, she had another couple of winners at the Shergar Cup. She's been an absolute stalwart in that. She's won the Alistair Haggis Silver Saddle uh, for the last two seasons now. But but also riding the Ascot winner um, this season. The fact that she'd given up, Maddie, you know, she was, she, was, she was doing ITV racing and she wasn't running, she's come back. And I think when people did, there were a few that thought, can she, can she really come back and get to the top of her game? It's an absolutely phenomenal return story. Yeah, exactly. And aren't we lucky to have her? I think for me, and what we've discussed this morning a little bit, is that jockeys you know, Emma Kieran's even touched on the pressure that jockeys put themselves under. And perhaps during that break, she really got back to herself and found out that racing was what she really wanted to do. And now I feel like she's taken a different approach and she's focusing less on banging and winners left, right and centre and more on enjoying the experience of riding. And I think you can see that in, in her, how she's performing. Did you, and feel free to say no, Emma, but did you, know, did, did you look up to Hayley as a rider when you were coming through the ranks? Absolutely. I mean, Hayley's been in this industry and riding at the top of her game for a long time, and I think she is an inspiration to a lot of the young girls that are coming through, and I think we need those role models out there that are going to encourage, um, encourage young people to come through. And again, aside from, from Hayley being a, a lady rider, the fact that she, she has come back um, we've had a lot of sort of stories recently, you know, Frankie is somebody that had thought about giving up. These riders who are, who are riding still at the top of their game, these headline riders we were used to seeing 10, 15 years ago, Jim, and they are, they are still, to knock, still difficult to knock off their perch. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Hayley's riding as well, if not better than ever, and she does seem to be riding with that sort of freedom and, and a little bit of a weightlift off her shoulder, really, so um, it's great to see. 
I wonder I wonder what that there is something I think mentally in it isn't there she does seem to be enjoying it so much we've got the same with Frankie at the moment which gives you that freedom in the saddle yeah absolutely I think if you can <clears throat> come back and choose to do the sport because you are enjoying it you've got less of that pressure you're not proving yourself you're there to enjoy it you've already stepped back from it you know what stepping back's like so why not just ride 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 as you can and with great success as well 2020 fixture list is out and um, there's been some criticism from uh, a number of sides that the pga have come out and said look perhaps it's not enough of a reduction given the pressures that are on the staff the the, the jockey club with regard in particular to the kempton fixtures and they've lost a good deal of fixtures uh, based upon this reduction of, of 20 fixtures in total first of all jim i suppose it boils down to the question it, it's being addressed do we have too much racing we're going to have 20 less fixtures next season is that a good thing in your mind yeah i mean it's not a simple equation is it you know it, uh, i think people think that having this as a, as a pot of money and you have less fixtures there's gonna be the same amount of money to divide around you know it's not the case each fixtures ge you know levy generating and, and money generating so you can't just slash fixtures as a, as a route to getting more money and we're always complaining there's not enough money so we need to be a little bit careful um but there's no doubt that a, a you know a, an ever bloating fixture list was becoming unsustainable for for the participants so did, did you feel that specifically with with your yard I don't know perhaps you didn't but you know did you feel there were there were pressures on your yard and, and your team because of the amount of racing particularly going into evening racing and finish times etc yeah of course but I mean you know we need to make ends meet and we need runners and winners to make ends meet so it's you know you've got to balance up the argument we we, we need we, we need to keep things afloat at our level and, and we need we need fixtures at that at that lower level and you know we need a certain number of them but um you know we also need to bear in mind that, that the welfare of, of all the sports participants is important and so um it's a it's a fine balance to be made and i think one thing that this is hoped it will do maddie is that I know we've only got 20 fewer fixtures, but we might see some more competitive races, perhaps handicap-wise, perhaps field sizes, and that can then have a, a positive impact on the levy, hopefully. But whether or not only 20 fewer will make a difference remains to be seen. I think seen. that's my main point. I mean, me and Jim discussed it as well. 20, is that really going to have that much of an impact? I'm not too sure. So it's not a, a huge, drastic change, but you wouldn't expect it to be because, obviously, the amount of um, money that those fixtures are generating is something that can't just be thrown away. It was announced earlier this week that Tudon Hotz uh, has been retired to, to stud uh, and will stand at Dallam Hall off the back of his win in the Sussex and an injury sustained, a hairline fracture. He had surgery. I believe that's all gone well. And we look forward to seeing what he does beyond the race course. What he did on the race course, Emma, was hugely exciting. But the two-year-old profile he had, where do, where do you stand on, on, on did he live up to, to that billing with that, that, the subsequent two Group 1 wins he's had? How are you left with Tudor Hot's race course career? You know, I, th I think his last couple of performances have been, been extremely um, strong performances. I haven't actually followed his career right from the very start, so possibly one of the other two would be able to he, he, take on this. He, well, I mean, he was the highest rated juvenile since Frank Hall. When we get quotes on that coming around, we think this is going to be an absolute champion, an absolute world beater. Um, he, he won a, a Sussex Stakes, he, he won over in France as well, but he just took a while to Jim to, to get to where I think plenty in the racing public and racing press hoped he would be. Um, it, I suppose it's a sign of how good a trainer John Gosden is to, to get him back to his, his very best. Or did he get back to his best? Um, yeah, I think the figures would show that he pretty much did get back to his best. Um, and I'm delighted that he did have the chance to get there because it, it was a bit like a bit of a damp squib those first two or three runs this season. And, uh, you know, people were a bit deflated with with Howard, Howard, uh, Howard come through but um, certainly those last two runs I think pretty much got him back to, to where he was whether he was the great superstar you know he, clearly he wasn't the next Frankel yeah. um, and he had blotted his copybook but at least he's, he's going out now having shown that uh, that two yard career wasn't, wasn't just a flash in the pan and it's going to be very exciting to see what he does at stud because you've got on the, you know with, with Dar Amy and, and, and Lati Dar and Somi Dar horses that have proved themselves over middle distances well he couldn't quite do that but with, with a bit of precocity that he might put into his offspring that could be very very exciting with his career at stud Maddie. Yeah exactly um, one thing that would be worth mentioning is there's been a lot of horses go to stud recently who have had short lived careers or mm -hmm. as two so again, there's a lot of fragility in his family, so I'm not sure if he'd be particularly popular with the, the breeders. Yeah, he, they've, been, you know, they, they've had some great horses, but they've, they've missed some, some races. There's been a, a lot of hard luck with regard to, to those horses. Now, this is a bookmaker responsibility. It's really in, in response to the uh, BBC documentary which, which came out, which was, I thought, a pretty 
partisan documentary, arguing one side of a, a story, but but arguing it well enough that um, it was an individual who, who, who tried to go out and, and double his money in a certain amount of weeks, titled Can You Beat the Bookies? One thing, Jim, that really came out of it was where the responsibility lies for the percentage of the population who do have an issue. And it was argued, I think, on the documentary that bookmakers don't do enough for the services they provide to then help those who fall foul of, of the gambling industry and have an issue. Where, where, to your mind, where, does, where should the responsibility lie? Do, do bookmakers do enough? Should they do more? Um, yeah, there's probably no doubt, and I think they've recognised the fact that they, they probably should be doing more. Um, you know, there's, everyone needs to take a little bit of personal responsibility, but there's, there's no doubt that um, the gambling industry does sucker in some people that probably haven't got the the, the means to resist and, and, and become you know addicted um, but it's like a lot of things it was a bit of a bookie bashing program and I felt it was slightly slightly one-sided in that respect um, a lot of people gamble and gamble totally responsibly and derive a lot of enjoyment out of it pleasure some will make money out of it most of them won't but most of them will be well within their means but there is obviously a percentage that for, for, for which it becomes a problem and uh, you know we all as a society and, and certainly the bookmakers themselves need to ensure that they're doing more than they are at the moment to, to ensure that they don't fall through the cracks. And I think it's probably the documentary coming out of a sign of where we are. It's something that ex skybet chief Richard Flint hit upon that we're at a time now where, where gambling is, is very much under the, the microscope because people have those issues and it, we, we're trying to become a greener world, a greener yeah. industry with regards to alcohol, to, to tobacco and to gambling sort of falls in there as well. Could that be a problem for the racing industry as it comes under more scrutiny? Potentially, yeah. I think you'd be foolish to say not. I mean, as someone who's come from not a racing background, if I brought up gambling to some of my non-racing friends, they'd automatically associate that with the, the negative side of it. But um, I think with a lot of things, it's about education and exercise and self-control for the individuals and trying to do our best to support them. Now, Animal Aid were in the headlines again earlier this week with their bus stunt, I think it, it's fair to call it, with the headline on the side of a bus effectively saying you wouldn't whip your dog, so why do we whip uh, horses? Richard Hughes, I think, came out and said, well, you wouldn't ride your dog either, or would you? Um, it is a stunt, isn't it? I suppose the problem is, Emma, there will be some walking around London who don't know the horse racing industry looking at that, and, and, and it will... It will play on their, their insecurities, it'll play on, on what they don't know about the industry, and that is a danger. We're, we're discussing, we're, we're all, you know, we're, we're adding to that because we're so um, disgraced by it, or, or we, we don't like what we've read, but equally some people will buy into it. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it, it is education, and I think those people who, I mean, little knowledge is probably dangerous, isn't it? Um, but I think, could we step away from using the term a whip? You know, everyone, when you think of the word a whip, you think pain, you, you see how it's been used in the past to, as a punishment. So can we, rather than calling it a whip, could we use it as a, a soft, pe I don't know whether we could refer to it as something else. I think stick and persuader have yeah, been out persuader. there because it doesn't, it doesn't give those. But then as, a, as somebody that is in and around racing, you'll be used to calling it a whip and there are no negative connotations for that. When you see something like that on, on the side of a bus, it's it, it, frankly ridiculous, isn't it? Well, but yeah. we're in the racing world saying that. Yeah, sure. And, you know, it's more the same from Animal Aid. We've seen this sort of stunt time and again from them. And, uh, you know, racing needs to be on the front foot. We've got a fantastic welfare record and we need to make sure we push that as strongly as possible rather than being an apologist for you know, what people on the outside who want to pull these stunts will try, and, will try and do to our sport. So we need to be aware of what's going on in the outside world, but also not be, not be these you know, apologists to, to try and sort of see them off. I think front foot is one, as Jim says, that's a key phrase that's come out of this. Yeah, um, for me, I feel very strongly about this. And, you know, in, our, in this social media savvy world where news is immediate, I think you've got to apply context. And Animal Aid haven't applied context because it's very clever sort of advertising. And um, as you say, it's gonna, that's going to upset a lot of people who aren't into the sport. But we have to acknowledge that they are there. Maddie, Jim, Emma, thank you very much. That is it for this week's Talking Points.